And thank you very much for inviting me to this seminar series to, to, give, to have the possibility to give my, my view of the research that we are doing in, in our group. And I will start with presenting myself. Uh, uh, so I'm Martin Singel. I come from Linköping University. I have my PhD in mathematical statistics here from Linköping University. And now I'm the head of the division of mathematical statistics and also associate professor in mathematical statistics. I'm, as Tillehun said, I'm very involved in this capacity building in, in, in mathematics and statistics and mostly in East Africa. So I'm the team leader for the Applied in Math and Statistics subprogram in Rwanda that the CEDA funded and also the, 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 the subprogram in, in, in Cambodia at the Royal University of Phnom Penh. But I'm also, I have, no, I have no official role in the other bilateral programs that we have but I'm also very involved in the bilateral programs in Tanzania, Uganda, and, and Mozambique, and so on. Um, for the moment, I'm the supervisor of, of five PhD students. Uh, now, I, I have supervised five students, uh, two from Rwanda, who has defended the thesis, uh, and one from Sweden, and three from Tanzania. That makes six. Yes, I just updated this one because uh, Edvard Engelu from Tanzania just defended in, 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 in June. But I'm also the, the main supervisor for the moment for three PhD students, two from Rwanda and one from Sweden. And I'm the co-supervisor of four, as you can see the nationalities there. Um, so this talk today that I will talk about is about supervised learning for repeated measurements uh, will be about what we are doing with this, what we call the growth models. And it will more or less involve many of the students that I have mentioned here. From the, from East Africa and so on. Um, and so, so you will hopefully get a picture of what they are doing as well when you're listening to me here today. Okay, so what, when you talk about supervised learning, I mean, nowadays when you talk about big data and artificial intelligence and so on, this word learning is very uh, top, high topic. I mean, it very people are interested in this. And when you say supervised learning, it sounds very very in my ears, and I think many believe in that it sounds very fancy and so on. But supervised learning is nothing else than, than regression and, and classification. And, and when you do regression is that, I mean, you, you, you know linear regression, uh, you try to fit a line or a hyperplane or something like that. And when you do classification is that you want to find a rule, how you can classify a, a new observation into classes. Uh, and so on. And I, I, I will talk about this regression and, and classification. And I will do that, especially with focus on this, what we call the growth curve model, the bilinear regression. Um, and, and this is, you use the growth curve model for something called repeated measurement data. And, and when you have repeated measurement data is that you, 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 you measure something over, say over time, time or space, it can be space as well, but, but mostly I'm thinking about time. So you're measuring something over time. So you're measuring some feature variable or some characteristic over time. It can be a universe variable. Um, say in medicine, you can measure the, the fever, the body temperature or something like that. Or you can have in pharmacy, in, 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 in environmental research, you can, you can do the temperature or, or how much it's raining or whatever over time and so on. Uh, and it can also, of course, be multivariate. You can measure several variables at the same time, but, but you're measuring them at the same time and then repeatedly over time. Uh, or it can be in space. Say that you're measuring something repeatedly in a lake, but on different depths. That, then you have also repeated measurements, but, but in space instead, something like that. And, and when you do this, you can model this. If you have a short time series, I mean, this is some kind of time series, but if you model this, you can model this with something called the groove curve model, or also known as bilinear regression. Uh, and this is repeated measurements, which we try to model with some kind of polynomial in time. Okay, so I have some examples here. So this is the classical example from 1964. And this is the, what, what is called dental measurement. So, so, so you're measuring the distance from the hypothesis uh, in the brain, uh, inside here, to, to a shin bone. So you, so you measure the distance from the hypothesis to a shin bone on, on, on kids. So they are, when they are eight years old, 10 years old, 12 years old, and 14 years old. 
So you have repeated measurements on the same individual four times. And then we have two different groups. So we have boys and we have girls. So we have 11 girls and 16 boys. So this is typically when you have this repeated measurements of, of a one dimensional variable. I mean, this is the distance. So you just mentioned it's univariate, but you're measuring it all the time. And if we put up, and this is a data example from 1964 from Potthoff and Roy, and this is the, how to say, the classical data that one is using when, when you talk about this growth curve model. Um, so we have the data, and so this X matrix here is of dimension four times 27. So the first, the first line here, the first row here in this matrix is this one. The second row is this one, and so on. So you have four rows and 27 columns. So the, the first 11 columns uh, are the girls and the, the next 16 columns are the boys. And this is repeated measurements over time. If we plot this data, it will look like this. So you have the green lines, there are the girls and you have the blue lines and there you have the boys. And then is the question, how can we model this kind of data when you do repeated measurements? And how do we estimate, if you put up a model, uh, how, 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 do you, how, how do you estimate all the parameters? And uh, how do we test all the parameters in a model? I mean, what kind of statistical tests are there? And what happens if we sample the data more often? I mean, here I, I did the measurements uh, every second year when they were eight, 10, 12, and 14 years old. What happens if you, if you do it every year or every half year? or every month and so on. Will, will that somehow uh, affect how, how, how you model the data? Uh, and, and will it affect your estimation procedure when you estimate the data and so on? I also have another example. Um, so here I have an example that you're looking at uh, uh, tumors. So you look at uh, and the, the, the first data was, the first example with the dental measurements was real data. And this example is just made up data. So I have just simulated the data here. So we cannot draw any conclusions from this data, but this is, I think it's a realistic example. So say, say, say that we have two, two kinds of tumors. You have benigma and malignant. I mean, you have good, somehow good tumors and bad tumors. And, and, and we try to model the size of the tumor with a third order polynomial. So we try to model the, the size of the tumor with a third third order polynomial in time. And this is for the two groups. This means the two different problems, uh, tumors, benign and malignant. And we do repeat the measurements on, on a number of individuals over time. And we do the P repeat the measurements. Say that we're measuring the size of the tumor for 10 weeks, and we do it once per week, every week. And then we also say that we have in each group of those, so we have 10 with benign tumors and we have 10 with malignant tumors. So when we put the data together here, we will have the 10 individuals that have the, the benign and we have 10 individuals that had malignant. And then those ones are, each of those ones are repeat the measurements. So they have 10 observations for each individual. And if I, if I look at the data, here is the data. So here is the, the 10 individuals and the 10 repeated measurements. And then we have with fully malignant like this. And then is the question, how, how can we model this one? If we look at the data first, it looks like this. So here you see the red ones is the malignant and the blue ones is the benign. And then it's just a question, how can we put up a, a probabilistic model for this one that we can use for, for prediction or, or maybe even as we will talk about later uh, as classification. So how, how do we do this? Okay, if you think about this matrix that we have, if you think about this X matrix, so for each of those ones, X, the X matrix here, I, I mean, I know that those 10 first individuals have the same kind of tumor. So I would like to model the size of this as, as, some, as, some, as a third order polynomial in time. So those 10 here should have the same expectation, the same expected value, what we can expect from them. And the, the same for this with malignant, they should have, the, to, the, the, those ones will be those ones, should have the, the size as malignant. 
And, and, and we know that we would like to model this as a third order polynomial for, for the first ones and for the second ones. So if I want, want to have this kind of structure here, I can do that with three, uh, two design matrices. I, I can do this with, with, with the matrix A, which is take into account that we have repeated measurements. So here you can see we have one is for the intercept and it's the first order, second order and third order. And then we have 10 repeated measurements. There's one up to 10. So I guess I, here I just take the time points. I call them one to 10, say, say weeks, for example. This matrix C here is just um, used to, to differentiate between the two groups. So first we have 10 with, with Benin, and then we have 10 with Malignant. And then I have the, the, the parameters for the polynomials. So here, this first column here will just be for the ones with uh, Benin, and these ones will be the ones for Malignant. So if I multiply this together, A, B, C, like this, we will just have this structure here. If you just multiply them together, you will see you will have mu1 to mu1, 10 of them because of this 10 here. You will have mu2 to mu2, 10 of them because of, 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 of uh, 10 of them because of this 10 here. So this is the way that we want to, 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 to model this kind of repeated measurements. And, and this is what we call a groove curve model. So if we do it formally, and this is what was done by Potofer Roy in 1964, is that we, we say that we have the matrix X, the random matrix X, or the observation on how, how it depends on how, how Peter it should be. But this one should be modeled with this ABC, where A is the design matrix to take into account the repeated measurements. C is the design matrix that should split it up to in, in, into different uh, groups. And B is the parameters that we use. And depending on what order we have on the polynomial, we, we choose this one, the A and B to, to, to fit this one here. E here is just a, we say it's a matrix normal distribution. So this is just a random error. Uh, and this one E here is just constructed in such a way that each of the individuals, um, has an error which is normally distributed with, with zero mean and a covariance matrix sigma. And, and then we say that the errors E1 up to EN, I mean, for the 20, say for, the, for, the, for all the individuals that we have, they are independently distributed. So when we're measuring the distance in, 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 from the hypothesis to the shin bone for, for those kids, we say that each kid are independent of the others. So there's no siblings, for example, and so on. Uh, if, if you look at for, for when we're measuring the, 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 the size of the tumor, all the patients, all the individuals that we have, they are independently of, of each other. But of course, there is a correlation over time because we are measuring on the same individual. So there is a correlation over time. And, and this correlation over time is, is we, we take that one, that one into account when we use this, this uh, covariance matrix sigma here. So the, this, this sigma here, we use that to model the the correlation over time. So, so um, if, if, if we say, I mean, we call this one a growth curve model, GCM, um, but one can also call it a, a generalized MANOVA model. MANOVA model is the, 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 the regular linear model that we use, I mean, the regression model. Um, and, and this one is a, a generalization of that one, because if we take A to be identity, and we have to have X is equal to BC, plus E, then this is just the, 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 the standard MANOVA model that we have. So, so that's the reason why this one is called the, the G MANOVA or the generalized MANOVA model uh, in this case. One can also say it's bilinear because we have a, if you look at the parameters here, we have a bilinear, bilinearity. We have A and C, and this is what we call, normally call a bilinear form. So, so, the, so this is a, a bilinear regression is also known, um, this model, model known as. And if I look at the, uh, the density for this one, I mean, uh, here I can just say that this, this, this X here, the, the observations we have that comes from a, a random matrix X, which is matrix normal distributed with the mean ABC. This is the expected value for this one. And then we have the, 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 the covariance between the rows, sigma between the repeated measurements, 
And then we have the identity because the, the columns, the individuals that are independently distributed. Um, so, th so this is this is the matrix normal distribution. Uh, probably many of you haven't seen this one, but but this is just a generalization in, in one 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 kind of generalization of the multivariate normal distribution. I mean the vector normal distribution, which is the what one normally use. But we can put up the density function for this one. The density function will lead us to the likelihood function. So this one is the likelihood function. And to find the, the maximum likelihood estimators, to estimate the parameters here is, is yes to, to, to maximize this likelihood function. And I mean, of course, one can try to take the derivatives here with respect to matrices B and sigma. The B is fine, that, that, that's no problem. But sigma is a bit tricky because sigma is, is symmetric. So it's not really straightforward to take the derivative with respect to sigma. And uh, so, so one can easiest do this with, with the help of inequalities. Uh, and, and this is well known. And if you do that, if you maximize this likelihood, and um, you will have something like this. So here we have, and here I also assume that A and C has full rank. Because if, if not A and C has full rank, we cannot take the inverse here, and we cannot take the inverse here. Because then this matrix has not full rank. So I, but for simplicity, I assume that A and C has full rank, uh, full, full column rank and full row rank. So, so because otherwise it will be, it, 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 we can write that out as well, but it will be more general and, and it takes just more space uh, for the moment. So, so we estimate, we can estimate the parameters here as, as B, B hat. And so this is the estimation. If I multiply this one, if I look at the full mean, I mean, the mean was ABC. If I look at the full mean, AB had C, uh, I mean, then I multiply here with an A and here with a C. And if I do that, I can write this as a PAV XPC. Those ones, P and P here, is just projection on, on different column spaces. Um, so, so this is just a projection on the column space of, on, 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 on column space of C transpose. And this is just a projection on the column space of A, where we have defined the inner product with the help of this matrix V here. And I, I will have a picture on the next slide so you can see it. If you look at the if you look at the covariance matrix sigma, which we also have to estimate because it's unknown. I mean the, the correlation over time. Um, the, 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 then we can um, estimate that one with the, the sum of squares of the residuals and the sum of squares of the Arrows here, uh, and, and and this one will just be something here, which is R R transpose and R one R one transpose, uh, and and you can also write those ones R one and R here as, as projections. Let, let us look at the next slide because on next slide, I I have I have the where we can look at the spaces and how this one is projected. So here you can see that if we if we have the the, the whole space. We, we can decompose the whole space in three parts. So here is the full space, the column space. And, and we can, so if you look at where, where this one, A, B hat C, A, B hat C was here the projection on the column space of A and the column space of C transpose. So, so, so when we estimate the, the mean the expectation, it will be estimated on this space here. When we estimate the, the covariance matrix, it will be estimated on, 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 on then it should be estimated on, on the orthogonal space. And the orthogonal to this space here is just yes, this space here. And we see that one part of this, what we call R, is, is, is estimated that we use this part here. And one part is this R1. Because R, we had that this was the orthogonal projection on the column space of C transpose. So it's here. And nothing about A, so that, that, that is free. And and R one, we could write that one as the, the orthogonal projection on on the column space of A, which would be here, and the projection on the column space of C transpose, which would be here. So so this is this is the case. And again, if you just look at the, the I mean, I said that this was the generalization of the MANOVA model. So if you look at the MANOVA model and we have that A is identity, then we only have this part here. So then we only have the column space of C transpose and the column space of C. So 
you who are from statistics and have done some regression, you know that you estimate the parameters on, on the column space of C transpose and the residuals on the orthogonal space, which means that the, the covariance, the, 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 the variance and the parameter estimates are, are, are independent when you do regression. In this case, you will not have, have it like that because it, you, you will have them to, to be dependent here. Okay, so, so when, when we did this one here, I mean, when we did, we put up the, the, the bilinear regression model when we did the estimation. So, so now one can say that now we have done one part of the supervised learning. Now we have done the regression part. Uh, so so here, here is the regression. There, there, is some, there, there is some problem, do you? Um, if you look at, again, if you look at the model that we had, so we say that we have some restrictions here. So, so, so the restrictions here is that P, P is the number of repeated measurements that we do on each individual. N is the number of individuals that we have in total for all groups. And the rank of C, say that C has full rank, means that this is the number of groups that we have. So in the case when we had the boys and the girls and the dental measurements, that the rank of C was two. Uh, I mean, I can, I can go back here, for example. Here you see the rank of this matrix is two. So this means that if it's full rank and we, we write it like this with, with the groups, then, then, then it's just the, this, the rank of C is just the same as the number of, 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 of groups. So here we say that the repeat the measurements should be smaller or equal to the total number of individuals minus the number of groups. And, and when we do this is you, because when we do this here, this is just what we normally call or a part of what we normally call the sample covariance matrix. And this one has to be uh, positive definite. And this is the, th this one is positive definite if P is, is less than N minus rank of C. So this one is, is positive definite if P is less than or equal to N minus rank of C. Because we take the inverse of that one here and we take it here. So, so we had that question before here. First, how to put up the model, that's fine. We can use a group of model. Secondly, how do we estimate all the parameters? Okay, we can do the maximum likelihood estimators and we find them here. And then we also had a question, what happens if we do the repeat the measurements more and more often? And, and something will happen here because if we do the repeat the measurements more and more often, means that P will increase. But if P is larger than N minus the rank of C, then this V here will be singular. And if V is singular, means that we cannot take the inverse and something, I mean, we will have problem here. We will have problem here, and we will also have problem with this one here because then this one will be singular. So somehow we had to take, to, take into account that one. Okay, uh, let us just start to look at. So, so I just plug in the data that we have from the dental measurements. So if I plug in the data, it will be like this uh, in, in the, the, the estimators, the estimates. And, and if we plot this one, it will be like this. So here you see that we have uh, a linear, uh, and I had, I had for both, for, for, for this with the dental measurements, I had a linear growth. So here I have a, a linear polynomial. So it means that here I have the, for, for the boys and here I have for the girls. And then I marked here those, uh, I don't know what the color is, purple, no, something. The, the, those ones here is just if I look at the mean of the boys here, I don't take you into account the groups, the, the, the timeline or something like that. I just look at the mean in this direction here. Then this one is that, that one there. So here we can see here we have the linear growth and here we have the, the linear growth for the girls. So it seems like the, the boys has a larger distance from the hypothesis to the shin bone. And it seems like they're growing faster. Of course, we can put up test for this. We can do a likelihood ratio test or we can do some tests for this. I, I will not really talk about that today, but one can do tests, say that if, if uh, is the slope large, slope for the boys, or that one larger than the slope for the girls, or the intercept larger for the boys than the, for the girls, for example, something like that. What, what one can also see here is that it seems like maybe linear growth here, linear growth for the girls seems to be fine. Because if you look at the mean here per, per, per time, it's, it seems to be okay. So linear growth for the girls seems to be a good model. 
but it maybe should be a, a, a quadratic, uh, a second order polynomial for the boys here. So we can catch this, this one here. And, and this can be modeled with something called the extended Grucke model. So the extended Grucke model is just that instead of looking at one of those ones here, then we have to have the same, the same polynomial for each group. We can add something here, and which means that we can add a second order term for the boys, but keep the first, just a linear growth for the, for the girls. So the, 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 this one can do with something called the extended Grucke model. If you look at the, the, what we had for the, for the tumors, uh, we had this one here. This will be just the MLEs. So if you take the data and put in and find the estimates for the tumor. And again, if we plot it, so it's easier to see how, how, how we plot it. Here you can see it's a, a thicker line, a red line. So this is the model I would suspect for the malignant. And the blue thick line here is the model that I would suspect for the, for the benign. So here I have modeled it like the, if, if it's a bad tumor, the size is going exponentially somehow. No, not exponentially because it's a third order, but it, it blows up here. I want to find this early in, 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 in what is happening with the size of the tumor. And if it's not a bad tumor, if the bending, the, 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 then it goes down like this. Then the, the body somehow take care of it. What's my idea when I simulated the data? Okay, and then here I said I simulated the data so we can look at the real values I, I used. So when I simulated the data, I used the black ones. So this is just to show that the maximum likelihood estimates in this case are quite close to the to 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 uh, to, to, to what uh, the, the real ones what we have. Um, I, we could look at some properties, and we can find the. Uh, if you look at the maximum likelihood estimators, we can find that this is unbiased. We can also find the covariance matrix for this one. Uh, it's like this. And here one can see that, that this part here, and here is the nice thing. Here we compare M is the rank of C. Uh, so here we compare uh, N minus M and P here. So when P goes, when P goes, uh, when P is close to N, this part will be small, which means that this one is, 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 is large. It's much larger than one, maybe. But normally this is, yes, uh, this is larger than one, but otherwise, otherwise we don't know. And um, if you look at what we have done with the, with the students, uh, I mean, I, I did first, I was looking for this when you have the growth curve model and, and you have some certain pattern on this, on this covariance matrix. So you know this, this is a correlation over time. So maybe you can put on some special restriction. I mean, some special structure that, that you know that this is the structure that we would like to use for, for the correlation over time. And here I was working in a paper together with my, my colleague, Professor Dieter von Rosen, who has been very much involved in all this, what I'm presenting here today. And he will talk about linear structure for the covariance matrix. And, and, the, and the, this paper was also the start for, for the next one where we talk about the, the extended Grucke model when we use two, two parts, A1, B1, C1, A2, B2, C2. And this was together with Yusuf and Sabanita from the University of Rwanda. And he was a senior student here in, in Linköping. And, and for later, we also did this one here uh, with the extended one uh, with, with any, any order M here. You can add how many as, as we want. And, and here, as I just said, so, so what we do here is just, if you like to use the more fancy word, like we are doing supervised learning, but this is just bilinear regression. Um, also, we did it when we had some structure here, but we also have not independent observations. So say that we would like to model somehow that the, the groups that we have within the groups, there are the, some dependency. As I said, maybe we look at siblings or maybe we look at some other regional uh, that we think that, that, that there is uh, some, some, some dependency between the individuals that we're looking at. So the, the, this is the kind of model that, that, that we use here, uh, like that. Uh, one can also extend this one, this, this uh, Grootker model, if you think about that as a tensor. So say instead of, instead of measuring one characteristic, maybe we're measuring Q characteristics, uh, so, so in, instead of just measuring the distance, maybe we're also measuring the how tall the person, or how tall the kids are. So we somehow would like to have into relation to to the to, to, to the body length. 
or something, or the weight or something like that, and see if there is any relation to that one. So that then, then we can use, instead of measuring one characteristic, we use measuring several. We can also have that we're measuring in, in repeat the measurements, say we're measuring over time, but also over some spatial, say, say the depths of lakes or something like that. Um, so so then, then we can model this, this uh, uh, instead of having a matrix of the data, we'll have a tensor. Here is a tensor of order three. So here I have uh, either two, two repeated measurements in two directions or something like that. One can also, this is just what we are doing. One can also extend this one. And this is what we do with uh, Innocent and Garouye, also from University of Rwanda. We did something called small area estimation. So here you see, here is, here is a growth curve model. So here is A, B, L, and here is, this is C in this model, HC for some certain. And then we can add some, some other parts here as well. So here we have a MANOVA part and we have a random part. It's what, what is called a mixed linear model. Oh, here. And this is used when we, we do something called small area estimation. The small area estimation is when you want to try to borrow strengths both across small areas. I mean, if you know that you're doing measurements surveys in some regions and you know that regions close to each other is dependent, but regions far away from each other not, and we want to borrow strengths from regions that is close to each other. And we do repeat the measurements over time. Um, and here is what we're doing right now and some ongoing research. And we have also a model like this. As you can see, here is a growth curve plus some MANOVA part. So we have uh, with the, our PhD student, Beatrice Pukusenge from the University of Rwanda. And, and also uh, 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 some ongoing when we have a similar model, but with some rank restrictions. But as you can see, all the, all the students, and this is uh, Felix Vamano, uh, who is from, from Makerere University. So as you can see, all, this, all the models that we have been considering here is about these repeated measurements that we're doing. So all of those ones, what is done here is, is supervised learning for, for growth curves, uh, just considering the regression part. <clears throat> um, so say, say now that we let P, the number of repeated measurements goes become larger. So say that the number of repeated measurements uh, getting closer and closer to n or n minus the number of groups that we have. So what will happen? So, so I have, an, I have a, a small example. There is a simulation. We can look at the plots instead because I, I think they say more. So here I have two groups. So this is uh, the red one and the blue one are the ones that I have uh, simulated data from. So say that we have, we have two groups, we have 25 individuals in each group. And, and so N minus M, so this, this will be 50 minus two is 48. So the upper limit of P is 48. Here I do, do from, from zero to 10, I do 10, 12 repeated measurements. So here we do repeated measurements like this. And then, then we try to estimate uh, I will try to estimate this red line here and estimate the blue line here, because this is this is the true ones, but we simulate data from them and then I estimate them and I will see if we can replicate them, if we can get them back, okay? So what will happen if we instead of re take 12 repeat the measurements between zero and 12, 10, and instead take 24? So we double it up. Will we get better information about the growth or will we not? get it. And also if we do it even more, we, we, instead of take 12 repeated or 24 repeated measurements, we take 48 repeated measurements. What will happen? I mean, the first feeling would be that, okay, um, we're taking more and more repeated measurements means that we should be able to estimate uh, the growth better and better because we get more and more information. Somehow we get more and more information. The problem is that those are those repeated measurements that we, we get are not independent because we take them repeated measurements on the same individual. So, so they are not independent. Uh, and, and in this case, I mean, I will come back to that soon, but in this case, 
we will have problem with this matrix V that I talked about before. Because here, this matrix V will be close to singular. So it will be very unstable. So when we do the estimation, um, it, it, will be, it will be poor, as we will see here. One way to overcome this is to, 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 to we proposed a, an unweighted estimator. It used to be a V inverse here in the middle between the A's here and the V inverse here. What happens if we just remove that V inverse? What, what estimator will we get then? It's not the maximum likelihood estimator, but what estimator? Uh, we can have some properties, but I, I think I, 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 yeah, we can say that. I mean, the, 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 the distribution for this estimator here is just normal distributed. So it's quite straightforward. It is unbiased and we have the covariance matrix. So here we could, here we could now compare this covariance matrix with the covariance matrix for the maximum likelihood estimator to see which, which estimator is the best one. And then think about what do we lose when we not include this V inverse in, in this estimator, when we do this, what we call the unweighted estimate. And, and we have used this in our two papers to, to construct tests for different cases when, when P goes to end, when we do more and more repeat the measurements, what is happening? Because when we do, in that case, we will not have the problem with this V inverse because there is no V inverse in this one. So, so, the, so V inverse doesn't matter if that is singular or not. So if you look at this one, we do the estimation. So here I have the, the red one is the real growth. The, the, the dashed one is the, is the weighted, is the MLE, that the one. And the dotted one is the unweighted one when we not have the V inverse. So if we do the, the estimation here, you see it's, it's quite okay. Both the unweighted and the weighted one is quite okay for the red one and quite okay for the blue one. Uh, when we have 12 repeat measurements. When we have 24 repeat measurements, it's even better. And this is intuitively good. We do more repeat measurements, something, uh, it should be more better because we have more information. But then when we do 48 repeat measurements, you can see the maximum likelihood estimator diverge a lot from the real growth here. And this is due to the fact that this V inverse is, is, is close to singular. It's very unstable. So here we have problem for, for that one. But, but the, un, the, the unweighted one is fine. Um, we can compare the estimators. So I can look at the covariance matrices. I can explain what is happening here more in detail. If you compare and look at the, uh, look, compare those covariance matrices here, you can do some, 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 some inequalities and you can compare it. Uh, you can also say that if, if you have this factor, as I said here, and this one is always greater than one, but it can be much, much greater one, one, than one. If N is close to P here, this one can be really large, which will make the covariance matrix for the maximum likelihood estimator to be much larger than for the unweighted one. And this is what we see when we do this, uh, in the, uh, when we look at the unweighted and the maximum likelihood estimator. So, so now we have answered the question also, what would happen if we do more and more repeat the measurements? Um, we will have problem with the maximum likelihood estimator, but we can overcome that by looking at the, the unweighted, un unweighted estimator instead. That, that can be one way. And, and we did that in two papers, me and Munis Rivastav, who is professor in statistics from University of Toronto. Uh, so, so we were looking at this one there. Okay, back to this problem here now with the uh, repeated measurements for, for the tumor. So say now that we have, a, we have an individual, um, this, this person, this uh, patient has, has a tumor and we're measuring the size of the tumor. And, and we do that for 10 repeated measurements. So this is the 10 repeated measurements that, that, that we have for 10 weeks for that, for that, uh, for that patient. Then of course is the question, what kind of tumor do we have? Is it a malign or is it a benign? Is it a bad or is it good? Do we have to put in treatment or not? So if you look at it, this one is the, based on the data that we have with 10 from malign, 10 from benign, we estimate the growth. This is the malign, the red one. The blue one is the uh, benign, the, the, the good one. This is the bad one, the good one. This is the observation that we have from the new individual. 
do this one follow the good tumor or the bad tumor? So now we want to classify, repeat the measurements. Uh, if we take another in individual, we take another patient, this is the one that we have. So now we have 10 repeat me measurements for another individual. Is this, is, is this a bad tumor or a good tumor? How, how can we classify this one? So then we come to the second part of supervised learning, supervised learning about classification. And classification is yes, that we want to, 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 to have an observation and we want to, to put that observation into one of several groups uh, or, or yeah. And, and, and this is happening every day when we have our computers, we look at spam, for example, we put the, the emails in spam or not, and so on. Um, we can do this. This is just the classical, classical way to do it. Um, we can, if you have seen this, with, this is done by Fisher from the 1930s. Um, we can put up the, the discriminant function for these linear cases in the multivariate normal, uh, what we have. So this is done. This is done in the 1930s, 40s, and uh, like this. And, and I, I, I think I go to this one here, what is happening. So if you have it in two dimension, and uh, what you do is yes, you find this hyperplane or, or this line, and you say that if, if you're on one side of the line, um, you, you classify it to one, one kind of data, and if you're in one, one group, and if you're on the other side, you classify it to the other group. And, and this is just if you have a multivariate normal. So here I don't have any repeat the measurements. But this, this, is my, this is my classification function in this case. So now instead, uh, instead of having just a multivariate normal, so this is the classical way to do it. Instead of having multivariate normal, I would like to change those means here, mu1 and mu2, to the repeat the measurements. So now we have repeat the measurements. So instead of measuring Q, P characteristics, I mean P different feature variables, uh, we we be measuring the same variable, but we're measuring it for p times. So now I have this. I have two groups with repeat the measurements. You can think about the two group with tumors, and I have a new observation, and I would like to classify this new observation into one of those two groups. So this is the one benign, and this is smiling out. So if I if I have this function. It, this is just a, a generalization of the Fisher's linear discriminant function. And if I do like this, uh, you can have this. Uh, yeah, and, and then I guess, of course, this is with known parameters, and we don't have the known parameters. We have to estimate the parameters here. And uh, so we just plug in the estimates instead. So if I use this for these two examples that I have, so this one here. Uh, is classified to being a, a bedding, which was also true. So this is this now is classified to the blue one, which was true. And this one was classified now to the to the red one. But I have I have simulated it from the blue one, so so this was not true. But of course this is not this is not too bad because now we we classify a, a good tumor to be bad. It's much, much worse if you classify the bad tumor to be good, because then, then we'd maybe not treat it. So, and, and this you can, this you can, uh, you can fix this with having some prior probabilities to, to fix which, which direction should be more important and so on. And um, what we did very recently, the, the last year was working together with Edward and Gailu uh, and, and looking at this, uh, misclassification probabilities. Um, so, so we did um, uh, looking at the asymptotic approximation of the misclassification probabilities. What is the probability of doing the wrong decision? And this is of course a very important quantity to say how good are our classifier. So we come up with this theorem here, just showing that, that we can calculate if an observation comes from the first group, but we classify it to the second group we have an approximation about what is this, this probability of making an error. Uh, it looks quite terrible, but it's not. Uh, one can analyze this one and see. And if you analyze this one, and if you simulate and do some, some, some studies on this one, uh, sorry, one can see that, that, that it's good. Maybe I put it here, yeah. 
it's good that one can see that larger P, more repeated measurements is better. So if we, if we have these more repeated measurements, then, then we can classify mass better. And the problem of course will be this, that this matrix V will be singular. If P is larger than N minus M, then V will be singular. And, and then the classification is poor again. So somehow we have to do this in high dimensions. We have to do it when P is larger than M. Because one can see that more and more repeat the measurements, the better we can do the classification. I just have two more slides on, on about the ongoing research. And we have, I'm working right now with two master progress projects, one in Rwanda, and he's doing classification now for this tensor case. So the same as we're doing for Grokker model, but he's writing it out for the tensor case. When you have this, instead of measuring one characteristic, one feature variable, you're measuring several. And then I also have a, just started a, a, a master project in, in, in the Royal University of Phnom Penh in Cambodia with a student, Praktara, Praktara, and he is considering doing this in a more non-parametric way. I mean, do some, some I mean, K-nearest neighbor is some famous, a good, uh, simple classifier. When you do it non-parametric, you don't have to assume normality and so on. And we, we want to see how, how good is this for repeated measurements and compare that to our Gruca model. And the last slide is just to summarize what we have done here with all the students and the, the upcoming students, just to, to visualize the, the, the work we are doing with, with this CEDA funded uh, programs that we have. Uh, and here is Yusef and Sabanita from Rwanda, his thesis 2015, in Garuya 2017, and now Edward and Gailo from 2020, he just defended in June. Uh, so this is what is done and ongoing. We have Beatrice from Rwanda as well, Felix from Akerere, who's soon done, both of them, and also Emeline, who's working on high dimensional discriminant analysis. And, and there I write, with application to group curves, it will probably do, because most of what we're doing is with an application to group curve. So, so I, I think and I hope that she will take care of about this, that we have more repeat the measurements, uh, more and more repeat the measurements, and, and, and we can see what's happening. Thank you.